the, this presentation is about my great, great aunt Lulu, as the program says. Um, actually, she's my half great, great aunt Lulu, <laughs> born Rose Harriet Weisbender, um, and you know was um, she was one of she was she was the first child of uh, Jacob the Learned Bootmaker, who her mother um, was dragged to the altar to marry. Um, and quickly, when he decided to leave um, Poland for America, she was just seemed fine with that. Um, <laughs> and she picked up a Romanian Jew named Israel Pastor. Um, so that's where the name comes from. Um, she came to call him father, um, living on London's East End. And, and then the family, um, actually the family passed through Germany, went to London, through London's East End, stayed there for years, and then came to, New York, um, came to Cleveland through New York Harbor, um, and later settled on the Lower East Side, um, and then moved up to the Bronx, which was, at that time, uh, <laughs> a move up in the world from the Bronx <laughs> to the village. Um, so, uh, like this photo, many and many immigrant families, uh, the contours of the story, of her story, had both had been in my family for a very long time, but had been sort of shrouded in, in a good level of darkness. Um, you know, like many New York families, our, our uh, history has not been handed down on crests, and it's not, um, you know, it's natural to attach ourselves to the little that we kind of, that we know. So my interest in her is partly because of her notoriety and the things that she's done, but also because um, she is she's a thread and, and a record of my family history, and one that there's actually information on, which is pretty unusual. So I started my journey, um, well, kind of at home, but it had a lot to do with these machines. And um, I'll just say that this, this has been a, an opportunity, basically, to have a deadline on something that I've been wanting to do for many years, as some members of my family know. Um, there's another, there was also another one at Yale where I took a trip with my father, and um, both, both schools had collections of Rose's work, um, and some slides, when we first put them on, at least at NYU, I don't think uh, my father saw this, but some of the slides when we first put them under the lens showed up entirely dark, and as you adjusted the contrast and brightness, the, the images of people from my family's past literally appeared out of the darkness. Um, like old ghosts, and it was pretty incredible. There were some incredible moments um, sitting there, particularly at the NYU library with that. So, and there were a lot of images sort of like this. I know that this isn't the clearest, um, <laughs> but this is, I, I am starting with it for a reason, um, and that's because um, it's where Rose, I'm not even sure which one she is, not that make much difference, but um, it's where she worked as a child laborer and eventually while she was working, um, perhaps not at this factory but another similar one, um, started writing columns at the same time during evenings for the English Daily News. Um, and it was there that her mother, it was at this time that her mother um, actually was involved in a strike and she sort of had a, sort of a, a class awakening um, during this period, and this picture, or you know, some some picture in her mind of these people would be something that she would return to often throughout her life, uh, even as she sort of rose to high society, high New York society. Um, she could never forget them, and also her life in Cleveland and London, where her family was devastatingly poor throughout her childhood, borrowed furniture often at high interest rates that was, that were then thrown out on the street. Um, they went hungry often. Um, her mother had, uh, I believe it was, I think it's six children um, with two different fathers, um, each one born in poverty that uh, didn't seem like it could possibly deepen, but somehow the family found, found room to, for one more. Her father began drinking heavily, um, at which she attributed to the class struggle, and would disappear for long periods uh, until the lady didn't come home. Um, and so it was this time she became a prohibitionist. She became a birth control advocate, and she was she was um, a, a union rights person and, and a socialist. So obviously these uh, personal um, these, these personal inspiration. This was the this period was a personal inspiration for all of those things that would come later. This 
was a, this was just an, an image of, of, of a push cart like the one that um, her father tried to make a living with in Cleveland and failed sort of miserably. And when, when she talked about him um, going to drinking, she actually said a, a weaker man would have gassed himself. It, it was just that bad. He just couldn't live. So. <clears throat> Um, so she, but her family got the Jewish daily news. Um, the, the roots of the Yiddish, um, Yiddish daily press uh, date back to 1885, and actually this was the first one, the Jewish daily news. Um, and she, um, somebody brought it to her house, and um, she ended up writing a letter. So I'm just going to read an excerpt from her autobiography. Um, we were living at seven. Sorry, we were living at seven six six Sterling Avenue when it um, when a neighbor brought my mother home copies of the Jewish Daily News. The editor of its English page was calling for suggestions from his readers. If you're in business, write a letter. Do you work in an office? Write a letter. Do you work in the factory? Write a letter. An interesting type at the end of columns, between articles, between short items. The invitation went forth in bold faced type to all the sun. The sundry, write a letter, write a letter, write a letter. I would never have written that letter had it not been for Mark Twain. His punch brothers punch for fair, punch in the presence of a passenger. He's brought to the factory by some wag or fellow of a fellow worker. The entire shop took sing song in it, and the dog won't make me hear my alarm clock. Early and late, tick words instead of moments. Do you work in a factory? Write a letter. Do you work in the factory? Write a letter. So she did. Um, she did, and she ended up writing a regular column for the Jewish Daily News. Um, she she did this while she was all still working in the factories, and it was called, it was called, called Dear Zelda, and doled out advice to young Jewish girls, um, which I'm going to read you an excerpt of. Um, in an article on October 23rd, 19, sorry, October 25th, 1903. Zelda sternly admonished, all you factory girls, love your work. The girl who hates her work is one too many for any employer. The girl who hates her work invariably hates her employer and foolishly holds him accountable for all the misery of the masses. Yes, this is a divergence. <laughs> um, she seems to write in whatever voice her editor wanted her to write. Although she did, in her autobiography, she talks about how she sort of started to realize that maybe the editors had a, a particular perspective that they wanted her to take on and that she didn't necessarily agree with. She was still fairly young at the time, but um, she also wrote to Jewish women who wanted to marry non-Jewish men, that, you know, that they shouldn't do that, and, and went on to marry um, a non-Jewish man herself. So <laughs> Zelda and, and Rose were a little different, but related. Um, so at a certain point, she just couldn't keep burning the candle at both ends, and she had to actually stop writing for the daily news. Um, the uh, this is again from her autobiography. The question had to be settled. Shall I earn an uncertain extra two dollars and risk my health, or drop writing and stay at the bench for more or less, for more or less certain five or six dollars? Of course I dropped the writing. We were eight human beings living on five or six dollars a week. Some will ask, how is it possible? The answer is sickness, semi-starvation, despair. These will only be words to some, but I know. Every wage worker knows. I have not forgotten. <coughs> Were I to live 50 times, 50 years, I could not forget all that these words imply. But I cannot tell their meaning here. I cannot write it and be believed. So she quit. Um, but she, she didn't want to. And then she eventually got an offer to come work full time. Um, the editor of the Jewish Daily News, who Rose was also believed, believed that she was in a romantic relationship with until she arrived in New York, um, decided that he would rather hire her than lose her to factory work. Um, so she writes, thus by virtue of Mark Twain, I left Cleveland for 12 years in the cigar factories to take up life and work in the city of New York. She also sent for her family, um, who later sent the love Lori's side. So um, one of the first places that uh, she uh, sort of became engaged in politically with the Educational Alliance Settlement movement was um, sort of everywhere at the time. It was definitely um, it's what brought her together with her future husband. So um, 
So Zelda, so she was also, before she even came, she, sorry, once she got here, she started writing not only the girls' column, Zelda, uh, just between us girls' column, but also um, the, she wrote The Observer. It was a column that were sketches of the Lower East Side. Um, and she um, worked at the Educational Alliance. So let's skip it around. So this is about her time, sort of just coming to New York and starting at the paper. She writes, the paper is a devil fish. I feel its tentacles about me. No time to read, no time to think, no more books. I'm sucked up into a, a maw hungrier than that of the factory. No free hours, all the hours are for the paper. All thought in my so-called free time to be, to be utilized for the columns. People know, I know what that is like, and uh, very much appreciated for being um, So, she had already interviewed Lillian Wald, um, who was uh, head of the Henry Street Settlement, um, and then was sent to go interview Graham Phelps Stokes, who was um, involved in the settlement movement as well, and was um, her, her future husband. Um, so he was involved particularly in the university settlement. So, there he is. She went to, when she went to go interview him, she was sent, she found, she actually found somebody on the street to come do it, essentially do it for her. She was so nervous. <coughs> uh, <laughs> so important. Um, uh, which is funny, again, as she's a person with a lot of contradictions. Uh, she wouldn't seem like somebody would be afraid to interview somebody, but she was. Um, and so it was the beginning what would, of what would become sort of a fairy tale love story that, um, that was not only in the newspapers all the time, but also became the basis of a book um, and a movie. And as I was doing this research, I kept finding more and more that sort of came, art that came out of her story. So I haven't even explored all of it yet. <coughs> but one of them um, was, uh, I'm just skipping out here. <laughs> this, so the fairy tale wedding um, was well documented, people knew who J.G. Phelps Stokes was, and um, the New York Times poked a lot of fun at, <laughs> at my ancestor here uh, when, when, when the engagement was announced. They referred to the first article that she wrote about um, Mr. Stokes, and um, this is what they wrote. Miss Pastor, um, uh, sorry. Uh, Miss Pastor obtained a denial of the rumors. When she went back to the office, she wrote a two-column story, wind and they put story in quotes, <laughs> winding up with an estimate of Mr. Stokes that prompted the city editor, city editor to say, Miss Pastor, if I thought as much of Mr. Stokes as you seem to, I would take care not to let anybody know it. Miss Pastor said regretfully yesterday that many of her impressions of Mr. Stokes had been cut out. This. This was left, this much was left, however. Mr. Stokes is a deep, strong thinker. His youthful face takes by virtue of its fresh, earnest, and kind expression. One glance at his face and you feel that Mr. Stokes loves humanity for all its sake. <laughs> and he speaks, and as he speaks on it with the sincerity, which is of the keynote of his character, you feel how the whole soul and the heart of the man is filled with welchmers. <laughs> You feel that he has sown his black young curls with bleaching cares of half a million men. <laughs> Mr. Stokes is very tall, and I believe six feet of third democracy. A third of a gentleman, a scholar, and a son of a millionaire. He is a man of the common people, even as Lincoln was. Because um, she got highly of him. Um, and, the times. and actually, at the bottom of this story, She's quoted as asking the Times to correct, oh, sorry, he's quoted at the end of the story, asking the Times to correct the fact that his family had a problem with their marriage. So they were instantly a fairy tale, but also instantly controversial, um, even in their wedding announcement. Obviously. So, um, there it is, the papers. There are, there are some of their wedding pictures. Definitely, 
different than the, uh, the factories there. So this is the book, um, this book that my, my mother helped me track down. This book um, was, is, is a fictional account based on her story. Um, and it's pretty closely based, although you see some of the language in it is not necessarily the language that they would have used, or the interpretations are different, but the storyline is similar. So I'm just going to play a little bit of it, and I'm going to read you some of the selections while, while I do some of the selections from that story. Um, so I'm, what I'm playing for you now is the movie that was based on it. This is just the trailer, so it's a silent film, so you'll just hear music, and I'm going to read over it. This is takes place after they first meet. Ah, how I could love him! I'd wrap my soul around him like a living flame. My child, you've been a revelation to me. The music of that sentence rang in her ears all night. The day had been too much for her. She could not sleep. Her thoughts were on fire. Toward morning at last, she dozed to dream of him and the new life of friendship with him. Then she awoke, and before her eyes was the light of his eyes, and in her heart the breath of his voice. Still under the spell of him, she went to the window, looking out of the fire escape where she kept her can of milk and groceries for her breakfast. The roaring tumult of the noises from the street below woke her from her dreams, wedged in jumbled shops and dwellings, pawn shops and various stalls, straight together begging for elbow room. Across the alley, a second-hand store protruded its rubbish. Broken stoves, beds, three-legged chairs sprawled up on the sidewalk. The unspeakable cheapness of a dry goods shop flared up in her face. Limp calico dresses of scarlet and purple, body blankets and pink and green and green checks. From the crowded windows hung dirty mattresses and bedding, flaunting banners of poverty. She slammed the window with a crash. God from, God from the world, how did I stand all this till now? So, <laughs> she continued to be in the newspapers as somebody who sort of embodied this contradiction of wealth and um, class consciousness. Uh, you see, lives will bloom as beautiful as the roses. There was definitely a fascination with her um, in the media. Here, um, you know what that is? <laughs> so, uh, she, she had many interests. She was, she was somebody who loved the arts. Um, and she is pictured here at Caritas Island, which is the island that her, is the, where the house that she and Graham Stokes would have quarters and, and a lot of Progressive people would come through there. There's a picture of her and her sister Lillian, um, and there's other pictures of her that were too grainy. That of her lounging on the lawn, and um, you know she definitely enjoyed um, relaxation and, and believed that working class people should have that. Um, she wanted to sing. Um, her three uncles, who had been called the Nightingales, were um, singers, um, and she wanted, she always wanted to write and almost gave up that dream, as I, I discussed before, for her to earn a living. Um, and then, you know, when she was finally freed from that, she just couldn't leave it behind. In this picture, um, you know, she looks carefree, but she would leave this place and, and go to picket lines all the time. Um, she wrote about how she used to be used in the cigar factories. Um, that her speed was being used to, to set the pace for other workers. Um, and she tried to apply what she had learned in the, days of, um, in the old days. She said, quote, in the old days at the bench, I used to wonder how it is that we get so little when we produce so much. Her search for answers then led her to socialism. Um, and, and Rhodes continued to engage on those issues, um, appearing regularly um, for doing organizing work, not just for who she married. Um, and I'm pretty certain now that I've read a lot of her materials that she gained a platform because of this marriage, but she would have been doing this work anyway. Um, this is the sort of uh, approach that, that they took, a hand-to-hand -hand battle with poverty. She talked about every, you know, she doesn't care if she doesn't sleep or eat. Every time they have a tiny victory, she's filled with joy. Um, 
this is the way she described it is she, she I, I think, beautifully framed her understanding of socialism, which was just this one political awakening, um, and that was no need to suffer poverty, and, and she said, what an earth-shattering idea. Um, and then she rolled up her sleeves to do that work. Um, she was regularly, uh, uh, she was regularly lecturing um, with the Interpretative Socialist Society. Um, she, this was just a typical week, uh, the 20th, the 21st, the 22nd, the 25th, the 26th. I mean, these are all different cities, as you can see. And this was, there's just tons of this stuff. A lot of what's in the archives are actually just stuff like this. Um, that you do get a sense of your life. Um, some of her notes. Oscar Wilde, a degenerate gentleman of the British arist aristocracy, this is, these are her words, remarked about Frank Harris. Not so much a gentleman, though possibly a little more degenerate. <coughs> She's, Frank has been invited to all the great houses in London once. And that's when she used that to describe what her speaking tours were like. <laughs> she, was, she was invited everywhere once, and, and actually never did. Um, but she was very happy she would go anywhere and talk to anybody. She's, if there was one person in the room, she still wanted to be there. She thought she had a message to share. So, there's some more of her notes. I just found these pretty fascinating. Um, the way she prepared for her talks was similar, similar to mine. <laughs> so, um, she spoke to universities and other organizations all over the country. Graham was also a regular speaker with the Intercollegiate Society, but began to feel that he was, she began to feel that he was less enthusiastic, um, and she wanted to stay in his hands endlessly after these events, and he was a little less into it. Um, she wrote, it was not until many years afterward that I realized why this, why this was so with him. Then it was borne in on me that he loved the people in theory only, that there was no personal warmth in him for them. Often I thought I detected a look of contempt for some member or members of my class. And that, that sentiment, I think, is essentially what broke them up, but maybe not entirely. We will see. Um, so, one of the other speakers, a, a regular on um, the Intercollegiate the Social Society, was Upton Sinclair. Um, uh, there was also Jack London on the ISS speaking circuit, Rose Newman Goldman from the Settlement Days, and exchanged letters with Margaret Sanger later um, on their birth, with their, about their shared interest in the birth control movement. Um, they, were, they were actually quite good friends, it seemed like, she and Upton Sinclair. Um, she also immersed herself in the actual organizational work of the strikers. Um, as it happened, Graham had an uncle in New, um, in New York's hotel industry, and it said that later he helped get, he, he was instrumental in having her arrested for um, at violating the espionage act. So, I, I guess she didn't, I guess he wasn't a fan of some of her political work. Um, she was not only involved in class issues, she also, um, she was involved in the, in the shirt waist strike. She was also involved in equal suffrage. This is a poem from hers from the Library of Congress. Um, I thought that this was nice, so I'll give you a second to look at it. She wrote a lot of poems. She also wrote poems for the, um, for the Jewish alien news and, and elsewhere. She wrote two plays. Um, well. um, she, it was a little later that she got into some more um, issues related to women, although she never she actually corrected people when they called her a feminist. She said she was not a feminist. I think by today's standards, she would probably say she was a feminist. And she seemed that she had something to say about everything, uh, but the underlying issue always came down to class as far as she was concerned. Um, this is about the ownership of land. Um, there, was not, there was not an issue that was sort of a, a prominent issue of the day that she wasn't chiming in on in newspapers regularly. She made a lot of enemies, and um, she also made a lot of friends. There's a letter from Margaret Sanger that we found in her own files. Um, 
and she did not spare criticism. She did not spare anyone for criticism. She regularly handed it to the press, despite her former work as a columnist. Um, she, in this, here, she, this is a sheepish reply to her from an editor that she's blasting for not covering an event in Brownsville, and he's just like, sorry, you were busy. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, the fact that she gets a reply is, is amazing. Um, so the, the sort of fracture in, it, or I think a, a, a sort of interesting point in her life, but also in her relationship, was World War I. Um, she had supported the war and then sort of began to change her um, perspective on that. Um, and that led to her, um, probably her breakup, or, or at least in part, but also her um, being convicted, charged and convicted of espionage later. Um, she had, he, though, would, would beg to differ. This is a letter from him that talks about why he thinks their relationship failed. Um, I like that he calls her girly. Uh, <laughs> but he basically, he says that uh, our troubles are due, or at least 99% of them, due to the fact that you're wholly selfish and do whatever you want, and, you know, it seems just like a regular breakup. That's <laughs> 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 um, But they had been, but their political perspectives had been widening for a long time, and they, they had um, sort of... They didn't necessarily see differently about segregation and Jim Crow, but um, she talked about how she didn't want, she was not willing to ride a segregated train car in the South. I believe that she did, uh, but she argued with him about attending segregated events. Um, and then eventually also had a, a break with the ISS over um, her trying to organize, sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Intercollegiate Social Society uh, over there, over wanting to organize black, uh, over naturally organizing a chapter of black students that should come to speak with, and then finding out later that this was some kind of problem she did, hadn't been aware of. Um, <clears throat> so Rose, uh, Rose was not the only person to take issue with trans politics. Um, this is also about Sin Sinclair sort of taking her side. So it was a point at which, at, at which the progressive movement was splitting, and she was going further left, um, and he was, Graham was sort of saying where he was. Um, and here's a, and, and this is when she started also to get in a little bit of trouble. This letter is really hard to understand, especially because it doesn't end, um, but it seems that it's telling her that this, whoever's writing this has been visited by somebody who wants to know more about her involvement in the party. Um, Um, accused of violating the Espionage Act, and she was, this was her offense. Uh, she wrote, she delivered a draft in Kansas City last Saturday. The communication said in part, um, I'm quoted as having said, I believe the government of the United States should have the unqualified support of every citizen in its war aims. I have made no such statement and I believe no such thing. No government which is for the profiteers can also be for the people, and I'm for the people. Um, and so that was her famous line. Um, Edward Snowden, I don't know, <laughs> different, very different reasons. Um, but she, she was arrested, and she was uh, depicted as being stoic um, and, and being carted off. And then it, she was able to appeal, and it was overturned on appeal, so she did not serve time for but obviously it was a very big deal, um, and she was sort of steadfast in her defense of, of her comments. She, before she did get divorced, and she did die in Germany, and she had breast cancer, and you know, there are other parts of her life, but that, that was sort of the main, the gist of the public part of her life. Um, and she was not very old when she died probably pretty typical for the time, but um, she accomplished a great deal in not so many years. Um, and it was a real, it was a real great experience.
experience actually getting to know more about her. I went to the Yale Library with my father, um, and we, you know, we, we dug through our archives. We, we found all these letters. Um, I took the I took her book um, on the number one train down to Christopher Street, uh, and you know, went to uh, the Robert w F. Wagner Labor Archives um, where there was there was even more information. Um, but really, um, there's also the Wagner Library. It's a pretty cool space. Mm -hmm. um, but really, the her life came to life for me on the train, on the number one train, um, and and they did so in her own words. Uh, when I got off of Christopher, Christopher Street, I was thinking, you know, how how different or the same this is. Right, this is where she lived, uh, Grove Street, um, is New York, and and the world that we live in, and started to think that it was quite different. Um, uh, and then there were so many things that made me think, you know, the world has not really changed that much. Um, I, visit, I also visited a Polish diner to, you know, sort of getting in touch with my roots. Um, but really, uh, you know, she is, what a lot of the things that she was grappling with are things that people are grappling with now and, and still hold true. Um, and she has sort of become, and I was so very surprised to learn how much she had become um, somebody of consequence to people other than people in my family. Um, I didn't know that. I really didn't. And I found out that she's still being, I mean, this is a current, this is 2012. Um, she's being dug up all the time. Her name is being brought up. And um, I was very glad to learn that. So I'm just going to read you a final clip of a sort of um, a piece about how she saw both war, uh, which I think you know charted the path for the, the end of her life, and um, and workers, and, and sort of what it means today. So she was talking about watching the cigars just gather um, after being rolled, and then sitting on a shelf, and then having all the workers <coughs> lay it off because the, the boss can get rid of the cigar. So they've been working and feverishly trying to produce as many cigars as possible, and then they're sitting on the shelf, and then they're fired, and she's trying to make sense of this as a young woman. Um, and so she writes, what becomes of the vast surplus? The, um, what becomes of it? Since the workers, um, sorry, may not, <laughs> to bring more their wages will buy back. The rich are limited. Uh, we, the workers, need all good things we have made. She's saying the workers are limited in terms, they can only have one house. We, the workers, need all the goods we have made, but the bosses will not give them back to us. And since we can buy back but little or nothing with low wages or none, the bosses look for other people in other lands, somewhere, anywhere in the world, upon whom to unload our products at a profit. In the meantime, they shut down the gates of industry. In the meantime, millions of us hunger. In the meantime, other millions work three days and hunger four. In the meantime, the bosses cut wages. In the meantime, deeper misery grips the working class. Nothing to be done about it, say the bosses. Wait, wait till we are rid of the surplus. Wait. Hard times, cry the workers, not knowing they are robbed in the mills, the mines, and the factories. Under consumption, cry the socialists, trying to know how we are robbed. Overproduction, go the capitalists, trying to blind us to the robbery. And then what happens to all the piled up products? What while we hunger and suffer for lack of it all? Part of it rots. Part of it is deliberately destroyed by the bosses to keep up prices. In the main, it stays piled up, mountain high. Throughout the length and breadth of the land, storerooms, warehouses, granaries burst with the goods and good and necessary things about our hand, that our hands have made. But we go hungry. We suffer. I'm going to skip a little. And then she says, in the meantime, they rush hither and yon, madly seeking a way out, a way of getting rid of the surplus. We have created and they have kept. They dare not delay too long. True, they need an employed army to keep down wages. But too great an army threatens the life of their system. Too great an army will break down the locked gates of industry. Too great an army will take possession of the tools of life. Too great an army will put an end to the rule of the bosses and secure to all men work and bread and life. Dare bosses rest until they get rid of the surplus? At a profit, always, of course. No, they dare not rest. They are tormented day and night, night and day, by one problem, one only. How to save themselves and continue to enslave us. And they have but one solution, war. Um, so that, that was pretty much
to everything she thought about in a nutshell. <laughs> and um, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to.